oh, about 13 after, and uh, I don't tend to be as long-winded as Pastor Aaron, so that's good news, so maybe that'll wake you up a little bit. Excuse me, I may take a few drinks throughout this morning, but uh, I've got other good news to share with you too, and I'm going to try to hold your attention and uh, keep you awake this morning. And maybe we can live, leave here a little more alert than we seem when we walk in this morning. <laughs> That's all right. And if you really want uh, a show, make sure you come next week to the kids' program. You won't want to miss that. I'm going to begin by reading from Luke 2. And this is from the KJV, because that's what most of us are familiar with, grew up memorizing, know this story. And so I, I, it's the same story in the ESV, but this language is a little more what we're familiar with and have memorized many of us. Luke 2, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This Advent season... We've been, we look to the coming of Jesus, and last week, uh, Pastor Aaron talked about hope, and um, we, we lit the candle representing hope, and well, I'm going to relight that one here at the end, uh, because if we lit it now, that whole candle would probably be burnt down by the time I'm done. So, But uh, Pastor Aaron talked about hope, and uh, the hope in Jesus, and that uh, before Jesus was born, they hoped in the coming of the Messiah. And we celebrate that now, and we know the hope that we can have Jesus within us and the hope of uh, life after this, eternal life with him, and that he is the king of kings, and we have our hope in him. And so we celebrate the coming of Jesus' birth and look to the coming of Jesus' return, whether in our lifetime or not. He is going to return. And this week, our theme, if you will, for Advent is peace. It's peace, and we sing about the, the different songs we sang this morning about peace and about the angels talking to the shepherds and uh, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. If you look at peace, uh, just from a basic definition, peace is the freedom from disturbance or tranquility, and I like that peace is the absence of hostility. That is just a Google definition of peace. But this morning, we're going to step back in time together to a world some 2,000 years ago and just put on your imaginations with me this morning and let's take a trip back in time. And we are on a road traveling to Bethlehem. It's about a 90-mile journey from where we started. And we're on this road and we obviously there's no cars there's no vehicles um, maybe we have some donkeys and uh, the 90 mile journey is going to take several days it's going to take several days i don't know how fast you can move in a day how much distance you can cover in this hilly country but it's going to take us a while so 
everything we need we have to take with us. And um, we probably have packed light because we're used to this kind of thing, but any clothes we take, any food, water, provisions for the journey, we need to pack with us. So we have our provisions, we have all these things, and we are traveling through the countryside. We're going together as a family, and we've actually joined with others who are traveling as well uh, because it's safer. Out here in the country, there's uh, wildlife that may attack you if you're alone, um, and there can be bandits and robbers, and it's just safer to stay together in a group. So we've joined with some other people who are traveling, and we are traveling uh, as well. We're headed to, to Bethlehem, and the reason we're out here is because our government uh, declared a census so that the world could be counted, and each one of us have to return back to uh, our hometown or where, where we're from to be counted, to be a part of this census. And so we're having to travel, and so that's why we're all going as a group, and that's why it's been easy to travel with others, because lots of people are having to travel for this census. And so we're out here traveling for uh, because the Roman government has said so, and uh, we are under occupation of the Romans. We are controlled by them. We are oppressed by them as a government. Uh, they no doubt probably want a census, maybe so they could even tax us more. Not that we have much means to pay these taxes with, but this is our government. This is who rule over us. They are full of corrupt leaders. Uh, king Herod, a murderous evil man, is uh, king of the area. And what's more than that, our religious system. We are uh, Jews. We are descendants from Abraham. We are God's chosen people, and we're traveling. And nobody's heard from God in over 400 years. There was a promise of a Messiah. There was a promise of freedom. See, we've been uh, in captivity for many years, and it's changed hands, and now it's the Romans. And we've been... There were prophets. God spoke to the prophets, but that's been over 400 years ago. Nobody's heard anything from God. There's just been silence. There's been darkness. Our religious system is maybe broken at best, kind of just steps you go through, not a lot there, and people just kind of live. And A lot of people don't have a lot of money, and here we are having to travel and take all this time off to travel this distance. And... So we're going to Bethlehem. We've met up with people. You've got to deal with it. This is just what we do. So we travel to Bethlehem, and we get there, and Bethlehem's overrun with people. There's lots of people who came to Bethlehem because of the census. And so we split up. We figure a group this size, we need to split up and try to find places to stay. And so uh, you, you guys over here are going to go check one side of town. You guys are going to check one side of town. You guys are going to check the middle. And, and so we split up, and we go, and uh, no relatives have room for us. No inns have room. We can't really find places to stay. And so we end up meeting back together, and no one has really found anything. Everywhere is just full, and uh, things are not looking that great for us on this trip. Uh, it, the trip of 90 miles probably take a week or so that we've been traveling, and we just want a place to rest and to be here for the census, get it over with, and get back home. But finally, someone comes running up, and they say, hey, we found a place. It's not much. It's a stable. It's a place where they keep their animals. But I talked to the guy, and he said there's some others in there. We could go join them and go stay in that stable and at least get out, you know, out of the elements, you know, a little bit, and um, maybe you know, light from our lanterns and things will shine a little better in there, and a place we can kind of uh, hang out and be, and maybe get some rest. And so we say, okay, let's do it. So we all head to this stable, and we get there, and there are others there, and so we kind of move the donkeys to one side, kind of move their pins a little bit, try to make them have a smaller corner and try to set up our stuff so we can, you know, have places to rest and kind of figure out who's going to stay where. There's not room for everybody, so some people make a little, you know, extra, put a little extra lean-to on the stable, you know, to sleep under and uh, maybe set up some kind of tents outside. And, and uh, here we are. Yippee. <laughs> And uh, we realized in the corner, some of these other people here, there's a young couple, and this girl's pregnant. And what we realized very fast is that she's, she's pregnant, like she's giving birth. And so quickly, you know, we, we decide who, who's, who's had experience, who's maybe a, a midwife, who could help. And so we kind of divide the room up, and, 
and try to hold, uh, put some sheets or different things up to kind of give some privacy because she's going into labor. She's going to have this baby. And just having traveled, you know, they, they say if you're pregnant and want to and help induce labor to walk, you talk about a 90-mile trip through a hilly country, <laughs> that probably induced labor. Now, maybe she rode on a donkey, but... And so the baby's born, and Mary wraps the baby in claw, uh, swaddling cloths, and uh, we get the manger that the donkeys had been eating out of and kind of, you know, take the hay off the top that maybe has donkey drool on it and try to make it as comfortable as possible and set the manger over by her and here, you can put the baby in this. And she lays the baby there, his baby born on this night. And uh, it's exciting. New life is always exciting. And the baby finally stops crying and sleeping. And, and Mary's resting and everything. And then there's this commotion outside. You know, we've all, we kind of gave space and we've kind of gathered back in, huddling down for the night. And there's this commotion outside. People are coming up. And we notice two people who come in. And we can tell by the way they're dressed that they're shepherds. And kind of wonder, what, what's this going to be? What's going on? And these shepherds run in, and they look like they've seen ghosts. They look just surprised and like they've seen ghosts. And they run in and look, and the first one looks around and finds the manger and just locks eyes on it, and his mouth, just jaw drops open and just stares. And the other one comes in about the same way and says, it's true, it's true, and hollers outside, hey, guys, in here. And a few more shepherds come piling in, and they start talking so fast no one can understand their story and what they're sharing and what they're saying, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And Maybe that was their manger. Maybe they wanted it back. I don't know. And finally, when they get their story together and they tell it where we can understand, they tell that they were just out in the field minding their own business, tending to their sheep, and angels appeared to them. And angels told them that a Savior has been born. The Messiah has been born. And that they would find him, the sign would be that they would find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And so they left and they began searching until they found this stable and this manger that had this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying there. And so by that sign and by the angel's word, this was the Savior of the world. This was the Messiah. And to all of us, all of a sudden, this little light flickers. That could it be that this, this is who the prophets were talking about? This is what God talked about some 400 years ago. We've been told the stories by our, our mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers about how God led our people out of Egypt and how God took care of us and how God set up the kings and all the different stories, but how our forefathers had sinned and rebelled, and so God allowed uh, us to be taken into captivity, but promised a Savior. We'd been ter told the stories. We knew these things, but it had just been silent for so long. It had been dark for so long. Isaiah 9-2 explains it. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. If you look at that, the people who walked in darkness... I've seen a great light. They're walking in darkness. It's just darkness. Silence from God, oppression, darkness. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. And that's what happened for us in the stable as we realized that this boy is Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world come. And hope ignites. And with that, peace. Because the angel said, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. With him will come peace. He's going to be the savior, the king. He's going to set up his kingdom and rule with peace and authority. And we just, it just, you can imagine if you're there in that place, knowing what you know, coming from what you know, how exciting that might have been, how emotional that might have been, how not sure what to do with that it might have been. And we all know that story. Because we've been told it over and over and over and over again since the time we were little and we celebrated every Christmas. And... But fast forward 2,000 some years back to today and uh, look around. Is our world at peace? Is our world at peace? If you look and we pray for Israel and the Middle East and uh, the world and our country, is there peace? Is there peace? Is uh, if you've gotten on the news or social media, you know there's not peace. There's hatred, there's killing, there's war, there's crazy, crazy ideas. Even if you're not on social media or watch the news, you still find out about it because it's all around. It's everywhere. 
it's in our country, it's in our city, it's in even some that would call themselves churches, have gone so far and so crazy that we just think, what is wrong with this world? What has this world come to? Where is God? Where is, where is the peace? What happened? What happened over these 2,000 years? Why is there not peace on earth? So we're going to look into this morning what, what peace Jesus really brought and how God in his great wisdom knew the peace that we would need. See, in a fallen world, me and you were born sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we are sinners in need of a Savior. We are in need of a Savior. And when we were in sin, we were at war with God. We were at war with God. And peace is the absence of hostility. So as sinners, you're at war with God. We were at war with God. We were hostile against God. But God is a just God. And as you know, this had to be, there had to be, a, in his justness, there had to be, um, there was a penalty that had to be paid. There was a penalty that had to be paid. But because he loved the world, he loved you and me, he sent his son to be born and as we know the rest of the story later, to die for our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins, for us, for us to pay that penalty so that we could be brought to peace with God. And that is the peace on earth that we can have. See, in war, there may be talks of peace and different things, and they come out and there's give and take, but in a conquering world, the conqueror defines the terms. You will do this, you will do this, and we'll have peace with you or we'll kill you. That's the terms. So in this war, God, God is the winner. God is the winner. God is the creator. He is the, the, the champion, but he, he, he gets to define the terms. And because he's a loving and good God, he said, here's the terms. I'm going to send my son to pay your penalty so that you can have peace with me, so that you can be my people. But what it takes is unconditional surrender. Like I said, there's not terms. We don't get to name terms in this peace treaty. We get to say, God, you're God. Here we are. But because God's a good God, he made a way through Jesus that he can be our Savior and our Redeemer through grace, his free gift, his salvation. This is the light that came into the world when Jesus was born. This is the hope that we have. This is the peace that he has come to bring Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. All the beatings and death on a cross and the death he experienced was to pay for our transgressions and to bring us peace. It says, And with his wounds we are healed. Romans Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good reason one would dare to even, though for perhaps, excuse me, for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. There's a lot, there's a lot in that passage. There's a lot, but we have peace with God. We can have peace with God through Jesus' death 
We have reconciled. We were enemies with God. But because of his blood, we are forgiven and we can be brought back into peace with God. We can be reconciled. Isaiah 50, let's see here. Isaiah 54.10 says, For the mountains made apart and the hills made and the hills removed. All right, so these mountains could crumble and fall or just vanish away. And God says that could happen on the earth. But my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. The world's crazy. Things are going on. Things are nuts. But nothing would be quite as crazy if those mountains just disappeared or crumbled and fell. And God said, even if those mountains crumble and fall, my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace. Peace. We can have peace within our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We can have peace with God. We can have peace. Jesus himself said, I have said uh, these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus didn't come to the, to the earth to make world peace in our day. Jesus came so that we could be at peace with our God. And he says as much. He said, in the world you'll have trouble. He said, but I've overcome the world. I've conquered the world. I am above and beyond and out of the world. And he said, in me you may have peace. And that's the peace. That's the light that came on Christmas. And that's the, 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 the glimmer of our hope. And that's where that peace comes from, that we can have peace with God. He also says, uh, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be trouble, troubled, neither let them be afraid. So Jesus came into the world, born, and the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Peace, this is all from God. This is part of God's divine wisdom and plan of salvation. This is God, the God who is a God of love. And he is also a God of peace. I've got a number of scriptures here I'm going to read to you that talk about this. Philippians 4.9, What do you have learned and received and heard and seen in me? Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. He's a God of peace. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He's a God of peace. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14.17. Romans 15.13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Romans 15.33, May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. He's the God of peace. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The God of peace will soon crush the real enemy. The one who makes this world, who tempted Adam and Eve, and we have fallen, but we can be at peace with him. And the devil is the enemy that Jesus defeated. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. God of peace. Second Peter 1, 2 says, may the grace and peace, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that's a tricky one because the verse itself says the peace of God surpasses all understanding. So we can't even begin to understand the peace that we can have that Jesus came to give us that's from God and from his spirit within us, all because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he sent him to be born in a manger and to live the Prince of Peace. I'm going to close this morning with a story. And
And um, this story, I'm told that this is my several great, 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 great something uncle. He uh, lived in the 1800s, and uh, he was an educated man and a writer. And he uh, had a family, and uh, there was some loss and grief in his life. Um, I think six, and one of them uh, died as an infant. And in, the, in July of 1861, his wife, Fanny, died. Um, her, he was napping, and her dress suddenly caught on fire from something, they're not sure what. And she was suddenly engulfed in flames uh, because of the kind of homemade dress. And when he awoke, he tried to help put out the fire, um, but the burns were too severe, and she died the next morning. And he himself was scarred uh, from that event. And from then on, whether well, it might have two meanings, he grew a big beard. He became known as this guy with his beard because uh, either the scars did not allow him to shave or because to cover the scars on his face from the burns, he just let his beard grow out. So he grieved that heavy loss, tragic, tragic death. And he grieved with that. Uh, that same year, 1861, the Civil War started. The Civil War started, a war that, uh, a country at war with itself. And the nation ripped apart and looked like it's splitting and all the many horrible, horrible things along with the Civil War. His son, in 1863, ran away to go join the army. And he became a lieutenant. And uh, for one of the first battle campaigns, actually was sick and was not able to be a part of that, but he was a, a part of another uh, series of a campaign or whatever in battles, but he was wounded. He was shot through the shoulder, and it exited the back, and went very close to his uh, spine. And uh, one, one report said nicked his spine even. And so my however many greats uncle went to, to go visit his son, who uh, he was you know, told may not make it. And when he got there, the first surgeon said, you know, he may not walk again, but... Uh, other surgeons gave him better reports, and um, so he was able to, 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 to get his son, and uh, they said, you know, it may be months before he can rejoin the army, and come to find out he was never able to rejoin the army, or he never did. And all this was going on in his life, and it brought them, his son was wounded November 27th, and so it brought him to Christmas time, 1863. He'd suffered with loss and grief, darkness, brokenness. The world around him fought, seemed to be falling apart. This tragic loss of his wife burns on his own body. His son, who he's nursing back to health and not sure the outcome of. and um, The country that's at war with itself and many fathers and husbands and sons wouldn't be coming home at all and wouldn't be coming home that Christmas because of the fight and the fighting that's been going on in the country during the Civil War. And as he sat, feeling that darkness, feeling the depression, feeling all the things, thinking about peace, no peace, he heard uh, the church bells. And many of you know him as Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He took up his pen, and on Christmas 1863, he wrote these words, feeling all that weight and all that pressure. He wrote, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old, familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Then from each black accursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. 
For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So he knew, even with all that going on, he knew the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. God is not dead. He does not sleep. And today, wherever you're at, what's going on in the world, what's going on in your heart, if you don't have that peace, you can have peace with God. You can have peace with God. And if you have that, remember, that's what Jesus came. And there's nothing that can take that away from you. No man, no war, no death. Nothing on this earth. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. God is patient. The Bible said he is a patient God, not wanting any, uh, the verses slip me now, to perish, but all to come to repentance. He's a patient God. He's been patient with us, and we can have peace with him. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a, savior, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Lasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that is the peace that Jesus came to give to us. And so this morning, I'm going to light the hope candle as well as the peace candle. And as we celebrate Jesus' birth and his coming and this peace that we can have and the peace he brings. So as we go this week and as we go in the Christmas season and we try to let our light shine to others and we try to celebrate and all the busyness and chaos that life brings our way, just remember that God is the God of peace. And Jesus same came so that we can have peace with him. And when life may seem black and crowding in, just remember those words, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Stand with me, if you will, and we'll be dismissed. Father God, thank you so much just for for everything, for your goodness, your love. Thank you that you sent Jesus to bring us hope, to bring us peace, that we can be at peace with you, Lord. Peace in our hearts that doesn't matter what happens here on this earth as long as we're at peace with you and that's what Jesus came to bring. I'm so thankful for that and we're thankful. I pray that you would help us as we go today and uh, continue in this Christmas season that we would uh, remember and think of this, that you are not asleep. You are alive. You are working. We don't always see it, but you are a big God. And in the darkness of 400 some years, you had a plan in Jesus, and we celebrate and thank you for that. And Lord, we just ask that that would just resonate, resonate in our souls as we go from here, that we can have a deep, deep peace with you, knowing that you are our Father and God the Creator, and that Jesus is King. And so we thank and praise you for that. ask that you go with us from this place and receive all the praise and glory in Jesus' great name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. God bless you.